You, you I, felt more like success as a man in jail than out of jail. I didn't feel it psychologically, but my balls felt. Your balls felt. Yeah. Can we gain the masculine energy back in society for the benefit of each man, but also for the greater good of society? Subscribe to the channel, Friends of Freedom. Now, I'm going to let Leo introduce this topic because I'm the conspiracy theorist. He's the scientist. And if I introduce it, I'm likely to get this video censored. So choose your words carefully, Leo. Okay. Well, I don't think it's a controversial... Well, it's an interesting subject. I don't think it should be a controversial one. The way I think I would introduce it is most of our listeners are male. And not all of them, of course. And I think this is interesting even to females. But our male listeners who lived in Western society, and apparently maybe even not in Western society, but certainly in Western society, may be feeling less masculine than they feel their forefathers felt, or maybe than even they felt earlier in their lives. And a lot of men have been uh, pointing, not the blame, but the cause of it to be changing social dynamics. Of course, societies evolve and cultures evolve. The question is, is the culture evolving a little too rapidly to be just a cultural uh, evolution, or maybe not so much, Not we don't phrase it like that, but rather, is it a change in culture that's making these men feel less masculine potentially? And is feeling less masculine or f experiencing these things actually making them less masculine? And even another level, is them being therefore less masculine making these cultural changes happen more? So let And me how can we fix it? Yeah, is there a solution to this? Like, can we gain the masculine energy back in society for the benefit of each man, but also for the greater good of society. Yeah, and I'm certainly not a conspiracy theorist. I've been looking into changes. I mean, by the way, this is not the first time course event change we've seen in human physiology. For example, um, in the 80s or 80s, 90s, a, hu a hot, really hot topic, and even before that, I think, was the change in what they call age of menarche, or I don't know how to pronounce it, I only read about it, which is the age at which women get their puberties. Mm. It was found to be declining for a time, then rising, and it was confused, confusing whether environmental effects or changes in lifestyle were causing this and whether it was beneficial or not. Since the 70s, though, an observation has been made in the declining rates of sperm counts in men worldwide. Now, sperm count is one facet of reproductive success in men. There are other facets. But the sperm count is quite instructive. In fact, we'll make another video about just how critical scientists think sperm counts are. But suffice it to say that in the last 50 years, which is only since the 1970s, remember, and right after the Cultural Revolution of the 60s, men's sperm counts have just about halved. That means they are about 50% what they were in the 1970s in America and as well uh, across Western Europe and even in China. And I want to point out that there are scientists like uh, in reputed journals questioning the future of the human species, that we may not be viable long term because of this really dramatic reduction in sperm counts. I think the uh, scientists have been less interested, of course, in populating the world because we have our population. But this much of a dramatic decline indicates something that potentially could be altered in our environment. Now, the general consensus, let's talk about testosterone before that. And then we'll discuss potential theories of why this happened. So we usually hear about sperm counts in the news. We don't as often hear about testosterone levels. Testosterone levels have also declined in the same period, specifically, beginning around the 1970s. There's evidence from the USA, from Finland, and from Israel, particularly in Israel, of declining sperm counts. But it's difficult to, it's much more difficult, oh, sorry, of declining testosterone levels. But it's much more difficult to study testosterone levels among aging, populations, meaning these populations are producing less young children over time or less children over time. So their, their age, average age is also increasing. So this troubles it a little bit, but it's quite clear that testosterone levels have been declining as well. There, now, there was also the theory that even before the 1970s, like you go back a thousand years, that men's testosterone levels were significantly higher. But I don't know if we have concrete data for that. But I mean, it's possible that even in the 1900s, it was declining a lot more. But certainly, the, the rate of decline since the 1970s is extremely alarming. So this has only been observed since the 1970s, to my knowledge. The, this ancient, these kind of things that pop up once in a while, which these are the conspiracy theories. Because they don't actually have blood work from people a thousand well, years ago. They have to estimate it based on all these That's the thing. Factors. Right now, when you're talking, I was thinking, how would you estimate a testosterone level? And it's... I mean, it's very difficult to estimate those kind of things because you're 
you're dealing with if, if you have some part of their genome you're dealing with that which is limited and things that affect testosterone are multifold especially testosterone levels i mean why wouldn't we say for example they had higher and better androgenic receptor activity or something you know it, i feel let's leave that out of the discussion so we don't distract uh, the audience but from facts these are facts so testosterone levels declined around the same time they're significant they're difficult to study and they're thought just like with the sperm count reduction to be mostly due to exposure to environmental estrogens but there are other there are other potential causes but this is thought to be the majority of it now just so you you guys know estrogen actually blocks some kind of testicular function in the testes also but it does store also in the hip hypothalamus and the pituitary in the brain your brain has a hypothalamus which is the most important part of your brain that regulates almost everything and second to that a pituitary which it sends signal to so the origin both of the signal to your testicles to produce sperm and the signal to your testicles to produce uh, testosterone lies in the hypoth hypothalamus the beginning there so that's why I said there's one root cause there can only be one because sperm count can decline potentially due to extreme oxidative stress or some other things but the testosterone level declining around the same time gonadotropin releasing hormone the chemical that your hypothalamus sends gonadotropin means from gonads and trophic being growing so gonadotropin releasing hormone is released by the hypothalamus to the pituitary pituitary sends luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone LH for testosterone and FSH for sperm count and the proliferation, proliferation differentiation of sperm. Interesting, LH, FSH also agonizes LH receptors, but this is a little bit complicated. You could think of it as two hormones doing one of each, but they come from the same earlier hormone, and that hormone can't differentiate between what's making and those. So GNA, GNRH must be down. Now, this is the crux of the issue I wanted to get. To. You know how, again, I mentioned this in another video. Sometimes when I come up with uh, personal ideas of why something, an effect may be more powerful than seen in academic literature or than expected is from personal experiences, trying drugs or being in situations where I needed help from a drug or some. Now, once I was in a very, and also I've lived a very unusual life doing very weird, unusual things, eclectic. So once I was in a jail for a couple of months, not for very long. And when I went into the jail, I was on hormones at the time. And I was, I think I was competing in arm wrestling or something. So I was a bit concerned because I went into the jail on like tran, on like low, low, maybe 50 milligrams of tran. I was actually taking Tony's IGF-1, probably, to be honest, it was like 2015 or something. I don't know, but I was taking a few things. And when I went into the jail, I was like, oh, this is gonna be interesting because I was working out, of course, for like five, six hours a day doing calisthenics and stuff, drinking like 20 milk cartons that I had to borrow through barter and stuff. But the, the issue was that a month down the line, I noticed, wait a minute, now, normally when I got off hormones in my early 20s, I would, go, I would be a bit hypogonadal without the HCG, and then it would recover in a month or two to my normal size. But recently, when I went off for short periods, it didn't seem to recover very quickly. Then I was in this environment, this ultra-competitive masculine environment in the gym, where there are no women, and it's very contradictory. Now, you would think it's because of the, th the threat of physical confrontation. I think it's also what it said, shows here social advancement increases GNRH. If you're in a very difficult social situation, I would liken it to being in a high string, uh, high strung, uh, in a like high power work environment, career, mm -hmm. or in any place that's highly competitive with other men, and you're able to succeed, it provides such a bolus signal to the gonadotropin releasing hormone cells in the hypothalamus that they work again. This might be through the mysterious Kispectin system, which nobody has figured out how to use. But this happened to me there. I had fuller gonads than I've had since I'd ever, before I touched steroids. It was ridiculous. It was actually uncomfortable. It was problematic for me. And I was like, this is clearly the evidence that extreme social success overwhelms so whatever's like, going on. The best PCT was going to jail and succeeding a little bit. You, and you felt more like success as a man in jail than out of jail. I didn't feel it psychologically, but my balls felt Your it. Your balls felt it. Yeah. And, and out of jail... I don't know. I never really, know. I never noticed a huge bolus. I, I always had normal testicular function unless I was using drugs. But this was something, both the recovery, which I didn't expect. I actually didn't expect it to have recovery. And it went beyond what I was seeing normally. It was so extreme, actually, it'd be completely forthright. Right after I left the jail, a couple of weeks later, I impregnated a woman on my first try by accident. And the first time I did that, it was usually I thought I had a pretty good handle on it. It worked immediately. So this is a true story from my private life. 
people could use this to embarrass me or whatever, but I'm telling you guys personal experiences so that you know that these things, I mean, I, I, when I try to tell you guys something might be going on, it's because like I have a personal experience with it, I've really felt it, and I've been very attentive to uh, small things I noticed. So let me show you what some of the research says. You could fill out a literature review with this, the social effects on sex hormones. But I just want to mention social advancement increases gonadotropin releasing hormone, will increase sper sperm count and testosterone crown. Social density, this is something off topic. People have been moving more and more into cities in the last half century and century in general, actually more than a century. So maybe there could be a decline. Social density decreases gonadotropin releasing hormone. I don't know why, maybe the feeling of intimidation or something like that. Um, interesting, just another, I just mentioned this one to, for you guys to know about the social thing. You can go on scholar.google.com, search social gonadotropin releasing hormone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, dominance, and you'll find tons of papers. But I want to mention something very interesting. I mentioned that serotonin as a neurotransmitter is one that makes you docile and conscientious in general. It's the opposite of an aggressive hormone in vertebrates. With that, and it's also an estrogenic, it's a female, somewhat female hormone. Females are better at verbal fluency due to their serotonergic levels, which are higher than men. And I mentioned that serotonin signaling is something that androgenic steroids decrease, and that raising it may protect the brain from some of the effects of androgenic steroids. Interestingly, people with genetic polymorphisms in their serotonin system experience an enhanced LH luteinizing hormone, the one for testosterone from your pituitary, suppression from estrogen. Meaning, if your serotonergic system is more active, your, your estrogen will inhibit your testosterone even more. So the more slightly feminized you are mentally, the more that feminine thing will block up your androgen signaling also a little bit, because serotonin is a feminizing mental illness in a way. So I, what I'm trying to show here is that basically social in, social uh, roles, the feeling of men, so keep in mind in the last 50 years, a lot of men, there were very few women working in the 1970s, in the early 1970s in America and around the world. And they often worked in very specific sort of diminutive positions like secretaries and so on. There were a lot of men that today would never have a secretary. Then in 1970, secretary was part of the, the job, no matter what, he has a private secretary. Men's positions at work, and also in their home life, with the change of marriage laws and child support and all these kind of things. A lot of the times, if you want to look at it objectively, not that we're supposed to supporting any kind of movement, there's a lot of benefits to this stuff, but objectively makes the man less socially dominant. And social dominance and advancement is the key element in raising testosterone levels, and social defeat is the key element in lowering it. To the end point, really quickly, is it the chicken or the egg? Did environmental estrogens and potentially other environmental contaminants and small-scale lifestyle changes cause men to become less testosterone-filled? and which we know very clearly affects their mentality for dominance, for aggression, for resilience, which then maybe change the way they look at the world and help them to support cultural changes, which then in turn, those cultural changes made these men less testosterone filled? Or was it that these just simply the cultural changes, which may have been driven uh, naturally, caused men to feel less dominant and socially driven, which then caused them to have less testosterone levels, which here, let's get to the crux of the issue. When you get to less testosterone levels, you also have less sperm levels, and therefore, fate of humanity is at risk when men don't feel appreciated socially. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, okay, the conspiracy theorist in me, I'm just going to launch out some quick ones. Oh, wait, wait. Be careful about anything that might get insensitive, because this is an academic video, yeah. and this might be appreciated by people. Yeah, so if, so if you're done with the science, if you got everything you need out of science, tune out.